Craig Scott, we are at the 25th anniversary now of Columbine, an event that you survived, that you went through, and that you very beautifully over the years have spoken about sharing your experience, your sister's life story, and so much more. Thanks for joining me today. Absolutely, Billy. Great to be on with you. So I want to start just as we're at this marker 25 years. I imagine in a lot of ways you can't imagine or believe how fast that time has gone by. What's going through your heart and your mind as we've hit this anniversary here? Yeah, there's a lot that's gone on in my mind. Uh, I've been thinking about what to say even for the last year because this I knew was kind of an important marker for me personally. Just 25 years later, um, I've I've dedicated a lot of my life to sharing uh, my sister's story, my story, and traveling around and speaking. My family started a an organization to share the life and legacy of my sister, and we've um, impacted millions of people. Uh, we became the largest school assembly program in the country. Um, so I, I I also work in film. I live in Atlanta and want to be a part of inspirational true stories. So uh, I've just been thinking about a lot this this anniversary. I'll be going back to Colorado and spending time with um, people in the community as well as my family. And I'll do a number of interviews out there because it was, you know, it was the first mass school shooting that happened in our country. Um, I've been followed a lot over through the years with media. And it's partly why I got into filmmaking and storytelling because uh, for a year, like Dateline followed me and gave me a camera and told me to film as much of my life as I wanted. And, um, and I, it's, you know, immediately after the shooting, um, I did this interview with Katie Couric and she called it her most memorable interview. And I was with my friend who was killed next to me, Isaiah and his dad, I was with Isaiah's dad. And, um, it really, you know, I real I realized early on that people, a lot of people saw the, the news media and, you know, saw it as invasive, but I didn't see it that way. I saw it as a way to get out a message and a story. So from early on, I had um, this belief that um, that God had a, a, a plan and a purpose for the worst tragedy in my life. And, and that belief, whether, you know, if somebody believes that or, or not, that belief has been uh, one of the ma- the biggest helpful things in my journey the last 25 years, this belief that God has a plan and a purpose for even the worst stuff that I go through. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned your friend who died next to you. You were in the library. You saw and experienced some of the most horrific things imaginable, particularly for a teenager, a kid at the time. You know, it was horrific for the entire country. You went through it. Coming out of that, when it comes to forgiveness, right? We talk a lot about forgiveness in our culture, maybe not enough, but the word gets thrown around a lot, but you really have had to deal with that. How did you get to a place of forgiveness? What was that journey like for you coming out of a situation where 12 kids, a teacher killed by their peers? It's just horrific. Yeah. A lot of times, um, I, you know, just a recap, a little bit about what I went through. I was in the library, which was the scene of the most intense shooting. Um, I watched as the shooters went around the room taunting students and treated it like uh, it was a game. Um, they came over to where I was. I saw my friend Isaiah, they called him racial slurs. They tried to pull him out from underneath the table. Um, they killed him. Then they killed my friend, Matt. And they left me underneath that table. I thought I was going to die. And I felt uh, that I heard God speak to me. Uh, and I, I am careful even with that phrase, God told me to do something because I know that my own thinking can get in the way um, of that still small voice that's within. But I felt very strongly and impressed that, that a voice that was all-knowing, wise, and uh, told me to get out of there. I was the first student to stand up looked down the room, around the room. I saw the shooters were gone and I yelled at everyone, let's get out of here. I, um, a group of us ran out. There's a police car outside. We all got behind the police car. And, um, shortly after the shooters came back into the library and began to exchange gunfire with the police, uh, behind the police car, I was holding a girl 
who was had been shot. She, her name was Val Schner, and she had a conversation with the shooters just minutes earlier where they were – one of them walked by her, and she said, oh, God, and it caught his attention. He said, God, you believe in God? And they had this conversation between the two of them where she was begging for her life. And, um, and finally she said she did, she said, yes. And then I heard uh, a shotgun and, uh, but she survived and I'm, I, and I'm holding her behind this police car, trying not to let her go to sleep. It's amazing what kicks in, you, you know, you, you think, uh, we're, we're more resilient, um, than we realize sometimes things automatically kick in that you don't even know. I mean, I'm 16 years old, just turned 16 and I'm holding and all I knew all of a sudden, it just came to me. You don't let someone who's losing blood go to sleep. You're also, I'm in total shock, which is your brain's way of kind of protecting you from the, the gravity of what you're dealing with. So you're in total shock. It feels surreal. Um, when I was in the library, I was completely paralyzed with fear and it, and it was, it was, um, less than 10 minutes, but it felt like it, uh, it felt like, um, you know, hours that I was in there because those seconds just, um, are so long and you're, you're totally, um, aware of every, you're, you're just in this very crazy, crazy place. What, what I, what I've learned about forget, uh, you know, you used to ask about forgiveness is, you know, a lot of times we don't realize we need forgiveness. Like we're angry about something. We don't know sometimes what it is we're carrying around some some stuff from our past some our anger for and i didn't realize it but for years i was um <laughs> i was for years i was angry and i hated the shooters uh, i mean i would the reason i hated them is because the news got the overall reason wrong why the shooting happened not because they were intentionally trying to, but everybody wanted to know why. And this story came out that's just not true. And the story is these guys were pushed to the edge with being bullied at school so bad that they got revenge. And that was the overall story that came out from Columbine. Even the psychologists and everybody in the community, everyone that's learned about Columbine realizes that's not what happened. That had to be frustrating, you know, to continue to hear that even now that still comes up, right? You know, as the primary reason, a lot of people go back to that media narrative and that's all they really know of the reasons. Yeah. So that is, that's a false narrative and it's not the reason why Columbine happened. It's a minor, smaller factor. It's a factor, but it's a, it's a smaller factor. And in fact, that caused in the mind of the American psyche, a bad formula that's existed for 25 years. And we need, as a country need to get rid of that formula. And the formula is, uh, oh, you've been bullied at school. Look out a school. You could do a school shooting. Well, that is so wrong because that's, that's the equivalent of you stepped on my toe. I'm going to cut off your limbs as justice. So we have to get rid of that thinking. It doesn't, it's not, it's, it's like a plus B equals a, you know, Z, it doesn't add up. But, um, so as I watched on the news and I, and I saw them being portrayed as getting bullied so bad and the, almost as if they were the victims and then watching them come into the library. And so you ask, well, why did Columbine happen? I don't have all the reasons I can't tell you everything, but I have learned a lot. And I can tell you that the, that I, what I've, after everything I've learned, as far as people are concerned, the biggest people responsible are the two shooters. It's not, it's not the school. It's not people that maybe treated them bad. It's not their parents. It's not the medication they were on. It's not the guns that they got. It's the choices that they made in their, in their heart to just to get into a dark place, to uh, choose to kill and, uh, and, and choices that they made to lie to not not uh, do the things that they are going to say they're going to do to all kinds of things. So, you know, even as a teenager, when I watched them at, uh, on the news, I, I, I remember, and they were older than me. They were a couple years older than me. And I thought they knew what they were doing. They were planning on it. They planned it. They planned, Eric specifically planned it for over a year. So very sick and twisted, dwelling on the darkest thoughts that you could have having these dark fantasies of of being in in power and 
and and showing the world your anger and your rage and all and just this uh, very egotistical, very arrogant um, uh, fantasy, and that Eric had. And then there were two different kids, and I've learned a lot about. And I say kids. One was seventeen. One was eighteen. Um, but they, just like other shooters and of shootings, they they knew what they were doing was 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 so wrong. Um, so, but back to the issue of forgiveness. Um, forgiveness is like setting a prisoner free and finding out that prisoner is you. So you have all this anger, and you and you realize forgiveness is what sets you free from that. Uh, forgiveness is a spiritual issue and people a lot of times misunderstand it. They think that forgiveness is saying, oh, it's okay what you did. Now, sometimes that it is when you, when you're meant to be in relation and connection with somebody, uh, you forgive them and you forget what they did and you say, it's okay. And you give them grace, you give them mercy, but sometimes something happens from someone and it's not okay. It's completely wrong and evil or whatever you want to call it. And at that point, it's not about saying it's okay. So you, and there's, it's saying, I'm going to choose to let go. And it's for your sake. Forgiveness most of the time is for you. It's for you. So I have a poem. My father writes a lot of poetry. My father um, and I have worked together and my whole family to uh, create a, a school assembly program to help prevent um, shootings, but more so to start the right kind of culture at schools. That's really what we do. But this is a poem I thought I'd share. Uh, Such words of wisdom I have heard that have a deep and truthful ring. From Gandhi and Mandela t- uh, to Martin Luther King. The weak cannot forgive, they said. They cling to bitterness instead. Forgiveness is misunderstood by those who hold to pain and rage. Their freedom gone, they choose to live like prisoners in a dreadful cage. They can't let go, they can't forgive, and so in bondage they now live. Forgive and you can be set free. Your life will now move on ahead, no longer bound by things long past, existing like the walking dead. Forgiveness opens up a door that sets you free to live once more. Unforgiveness keeps you chained. And so, you know, that's that's the essence of it is a forgiveness is a freeing thing and people don't realize well they because what happens is you go well i have a right to be angry yes you do it's for some things that have happened you can either hold on to that right and it let it eat you inside and it then comes out in different ways usually on people that you don't intend it to go out onto or onto yourself or you are living in torment in your mental health or you have an attitude of forgiveness and choose to let go. And so that's an issue that I have to deal with a lot of times. Billy, I've probably had about in my life, I've probably had no exaggeration of probably 30,000 young people tell me the worst thing that's ever happened to them. After I speak, I make myself available and kids come up to me and they hear my story and they tell me what they went through. And so I've heard a lot of very terrible stories. But I've also seen a lot of amazing things and choices that, that, that teens have made and people have made to say, uh, hey, I want to be a part of the chain reaction that your sister started. My sister's talked about starting a chain reaction of kindness, compassion. And, you know, they basically choose, um, make a, a choice there after hearing the, the story that I share to uh, a catalyst moment of change, you know. And so, um, and a lot of times this issue of being able to let go of somebody that's really hurt them, you know, and you can, you can forgive somebody and even not have that person be in your life. It doesn't mean you have to be in connection with that person. Um, if you can, the best thing, if that person is, is reconciliation, you know, to go and be reconciled with that person. But, um, uh, so I forgave the shooters at Columbine but I would not pardon them. Pardon is a different, is an issue of the law. If they had not killed themselves that day, I would have, I would, I believe that they belonged in prison so that they couldn't do that again until maybe, you know, uh, years and years down the road that they were a a completely different person. But, um, so that's, that's, I want to I want to ask you something about your sister be, because you brought you've brought her up a couple of times and your sister many people know her story 
some people might not, but your sister, obviously she lost her life at Columbine. She was killed in the midst of all of this. And so when we talk about forgiveness, understanding you just shared the horrific thing that you went through, right? And then on top of that, the loss of your sister. I mean, there's multiple layers here. Um, what would you want people to know? We're at this 25 year anniversary. Your sister has had a massive impact on a lot of people's lives through the books that your parents have written on her. But what would you, and in a film about her, what would you want people to know about her? Well, she had uh, a prayer in her life, and it was to be used to impact people and to, in a positive way. And she wanted to start a, a, a positive chain reaction. Um, when she was 13 years old, she traced her hands like this on the back of an old dresser and wrote, these hands belong to Rachel Joy Scott and will someday touch millions of people's hearts. She kept a lot of journals. She had seven journals at the time of her death. And she's become like a modern day Anne Frank. There's thousands of kids every year that do report, or book reports on her. Uh, there's quotes of hers in, on the hallways and schools of hundreds of schools right now, Muriel's made. So she's become this role model of kindness and compassion because she wrote an essay a month before she died talking about how to treat people and stepping out of your way to start a, what she called the chain reaction of kindness and compassion. And, and she, she lived it too. We heard a number of stories of people that she uh, befriended. There's a boy at my school who had a disability who was usually left out of things. And one day he was getting picked on and Rachel went up and stood up for him. And then after that, um, he came up to my family after the shooting and said, uh, Rachel didn't know it, but I was thinking about taking my own life. And she started saying hi to me every day in the hallway, you know, and have to have this like pretty girl saying hi to him. And he was socially awkward and she didn't become his best friend, but she took a minute out of her day for him. And yeah. you never know how far a little bit of kindness can go, you know, that little act. So we start chain reactions every day that either give life or, or negative or, or uh, have a negative impact. But I'll share with you just a couple things that she wrote. And, and as you said, uh, there's a movie called I'm Not Ashamed. If you'd like to find um, my friend Macy, who you've had on your show, she's a friend and she did a wonderful job playing my sister. Um, every time you, if you get a chance to see the movie, especially if you have uh, faith and want to see somebody who struggles with faith and go, has real teen pain, you know, real painful issues and struggling and doubts and watch this, it'd be very inspiring. If you get to see it, just know that every time you hear uh, the narrative voice, that's straight from my sister's journals verbatim. So I'll read you a couple of her journals. Um, this one she wrote, uh, this is a journal entry. She said, don't put limits on what I can do. I have faith. Why can't you? Don't keep me from my dreams. I can reach them if I believe. She wrote, things untold, things unseen. One day all these things will come to me. Life of meaning, life of hope, life of significance is mine to cope. I have a purpose. I have a dream. I have a future. And then she ends it with this, so it seems. So one of the other things about her life, um, she told my sister, my cousins, her friends, she had this feeling that she wasn't going to live to have a long life. And none of us want to hear her talk that way. Um, and she, uh, but she just had this feeling that she was going to, God was going to use her to impact a lot of people, but that she wasn't going to be around very long. She also uh, wrote this. Um, she was, she was seeing the hurt in our world. People are crying, losing their minds. People are dying, taking their lives. Will anyone save them? Will, some, will anyone help? Will somebody listen? Or am I all by myself? You know, sometimes it's hard to listen because we open up ourselves to be influenced by people's... And, and, and we have to use discernment. You know, who am I? Who uh, Jesus himself didn't help everyone. A lot of people think that he, he, he had to retreat, go away himself and spend time with, with God the Father. He had to go off on his time to get, uh, you know, he didn't just go around feeling every person's need all the time. He only did what he felt he was supposed to do, following his heart and following what he believed the Father was telling him. So Rachel here is just writing about, you know, seeing this dying, crying and Will anyone save them? Will anyone help? 
with somebody listening or my all by myself. And the last thing I'll share with you is this that she wrote. She said, I have my ups and downs and I fall a few times, but I don't give up. Mm. Don't give up because God rewards, God's reward is worth it all. I challenge you to listen and see what God will do. Take a risk, chance it and trust in God. You will see what God can do with a willing heart. And that's, you know, that's, that's when it comes down to our faith. You know, my sister, um, in the last moments of her life, she had a, she was questioned about her faith and, uh, that's, that's been questioned in, you know, in, in, uh, in a matter of controversy, but I can tell you why I, I can say that confidently. Um, and it's from, uh, her account, uh, never made it into a police report because of the boy that was with her. Um, he was paralyzed. Um, but the first thing he said when he woke up, he was shot, um, was where's Rachel. And then he told them that they were mocking her for her faith and they knew my sister, uh, but he, he then went back into a coma and then, um, so his account never made it to a police report. So there was like controversy, um, around that issue. But, um, either way, my sister, uh, was living out her faith in a genuine way. But she wasn't the kind of person to like uh, cram it down someone's, you know, she, she, she was doing it through more how she was treating people and building relations. So yeah, yeah can she I just impact millions and she'll continue to is um, her, her, I believe her story, Billy, will be one that lasts a long, long time. And, and it's in, we've, we've put it into the school system and she's a wonderful role model. And, you know, um, her story has literally saved, uh, thousands of lives. I have a book here at home of 2000 uh, of over 10,000 emails from kids in a two year time period that heard her story and wrote, took time to get on the website and write and say, her story saved my life. Um, I have, uh, and I know I, I go, I, I know I take a long time to answer your questions, but that's okay. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack. I mean, I was just going to add as you're pulling, as you're looking through there, you know, it is, it's interesting to me, you know, I'm an only child. I don't have siblings. You have this sibling, you know, who you live with, you know, very well, and you have this event happen. And I would imagine there's a whole different lens through which you even see your sister now compared to growing up, you know, being with her in that way. And I've actually never asked you this before, but, but I am curious in how your view of your sister has been illuminated or changed as a result of the events that happened and getting a chance to see her heart through these journals over the years and to, to look and think differently about her as a result of that. Yeah. Well now I'm, I'm, I'm almost old enough to be her age when she passed away. I mean, a, a father, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm old enough to be her father, you know, like, so here on earth, she, she's my little sister now, you know, but I believe her, she continues to exist. She still is my older sister. So, but she only lived to be 17. So I see some, in some ways, how she only got to be 17. But then I see other times in it and the wisdom that she had, um, this, you know, and this, there's a scripture that says the spirit knows all things. Our spirit has such profound wisdom and can speak it, you know, at different times in our life and has an understanding, a peace that passes understanding even when we're young. So I just see her as a, she, she is, um, she was my sister, but she's also a martyr. She, she, uh, she was also prophetic. Um, she, 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 uh, she drew a picture about a half hour before she was killed of her eyes crying 13 tears. There were 13 victims that day, 12 students and a teacher watering a rose with drops of blood coming off from it. She showed her teacher this drawing at the very end of class and her teacher, Mrs. Carruthers, who I had later on said, wow, Rachel, what is it? And she said, it's my tears. I'm crying. And then she said that, uh, Ms. Carruthers, like, wow, Rachel, it's beautiful. And then she said, Rachel looked at her and said, Mrs. Carruthers, I'm going to have an impact on the world. And she walked out of class and, uh, and not a half hour later, she was killed. And so, um, you know, she, 
And then in the last moments of her life, Eric picked her up by her hair and said, do you still believe in God? And she was crying and, and she said, you know, I do. And he said, well, go be with him. She took her last shot. So to me, she had a lot of courage. I look at this, I look at my sister and she, uh, she lived life vibrantly. Her middle name was Joy. And right now I've been working on a presentation and a book called Finding Joy. Because I see today that one of the biggest things I'm seeing is just isolation and disconnection. And part of that is because of COVID. Part of that is because of technology. Um, we have social media, uh, but yet how is it that we're, that we're so disconnected? And it's because this, this is an amazing tool. It's a, it's a wonderful servant and a terrible master. And, and also we're connected to the world. We don't need to be connected to everything all the time. We need to know what we need to be connected with. We need to choose positive influences. We need to limit the time that we're this needs to serve us, not us be addicted to it. There are people yeah. that created programs on here to be addictive. And so what's happening is, you know, it, it's true of all of us, but especially young people can uh, have everything relational happening through a device, but it cannot ultimately replace in person time. And we've got to get, we've got to be intentional with having digital t detox and I talk to the kids about this. I talk about mental health and uh, becoming aware of your emotions, how to translate certain negative emotions into positive ones, like anger into determination, sadness into an appreciation for life, psychologically sound, culturally relevant, and biblically based principles. And so, but um, so my sister, she lived in a time, this is my sister right here, she lived in a time way before. Uh, any of this, there was no social media. Internet was just now coming into play. So she was writing her thoughts and her feelings down in journals. And I, I tell, I keep journals, uh, record your story. I, t I talk to kids about that. Um, record what's happening in your life right now, because uh, you never know, you might go back and it might become really important for you to see your journey along the way. It might turn into a book. It might influence other people, but she, uh, she, her, you know, the 17 year old girl like Anne Frank, um, has impacted. We grew up reading about Anne and her kindness and the things that she wrote. And now kids learn about my sister, um, as well as Anne Frank. You know, as we're talking about all of this, you just mentioned a number of issues, you know, that are, that are going on right now that are affecting young people. Why do you think, and in so many ways, Columbine was sort of the first of these events that got into the American conscience, right? And that really shocked people. Why do you think America is in its current moral and ethical conundrum, which is a much broader issue? You know, the shootings are one part of what is going on. Why do you think, how do you think America ended up here morally and ethically? Well, like you said, that's a, that's a big that's a big question. But what I've, what I know is that we, for a long time as a country, we were number one in the world, for example, with education, we were number one in the world for nearly 200 years as a first world nation in education. Every single teacher knew something called the three H's. It was before the three R's. So my parents knew the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Um, but before the three R's um, were the three H's. Every teacher knew the three H's. It was the heart, the head, and the hands. And when we were teaching, that was the motto. That was our, you have to understand, that was the, the uh, philosophy of our system. That was the core belief uh, of educators, that we were first to teach the heart of students, and then knowledge and academic achievement, and then their hands for work and, 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 and for application. So... First, we taught morals, values, issues of the heart. Now, at the time, it was it was it was also uh, a lot of it was connected with religious principle. So, in 1963, uh, we as a country kind of started to remove anything to deal with because we have a lot of different religions in our country. But we're still uh, predominantly, if there was any one religion, we're still pr predominantly a Christian. 
uh, based country. We, that is our foundation, whether people want to believe it or not. Our founding fathers were Christian men. Uh, they did believe, uh, and, and I, my dad is a scholar in American history. Um, and, and, and we've done, I've done a lot of study and anyone who tells me that the founding fathers were not, uh, uh, Christian men, I, I I can totally blow away their argument. I mean, it's the evidence is is huge and to what our foundation is. So, but we can't go back in time. Uh, we cannot go re- revert back to those days. What we can do is look at the principle of how do we, as a nation, in our schools, what is our driving philosophy? Is it knowledge and academic achievement? Because guess what? You can find out anything. And guess what? Eric Harris, who killed my sister and killed, you know, the uh, and, and Dylan, who killed uh, 12 students, a teacher, they were smart. Eric was smart. He had knowledge. The problem wasn't the education of his, of his head. It was the education of his heart. Uh, and so um, we have to get back to a place. And a lot. And this is what most educators want. They get into education because they care about kids, um, you know. But it's also a very tough job, and there and kids are walking into the school building with a lot of different issues that they are not responsible for. That they're, I mean, that they're, you know, they, yeah, they, they had nothing to do with uh, anger, angry attitudes, some addictions, uh, some total rebelliousness, you know, and yet. In some ways, the really good educators, they make it relational with their students. And you can remember your favorite educator, teacher. So this is more the world that I work in. And so you asked me, you know, what are, what are, what are uh, the moral, ethical things that our country is going through? Well, we, if we want some antidotes and correction, I think we have to not just think about teach making academic achievement or knowledge a priority that was not the priority when we were number one in the world the priority was first character principles and how do we impart that onto our children and then knowledge and when yeah. and we were far superior uh academically uh in 1963 when we decided to remove in essence uh, a, a recognition that we're three part beings, spirit, mind, and body. And just say, we're, you know, we're going to remove everything to do with, with that side, take out God out of everything, take out anything, um, faith related, uh, they're left a void. And, yeah. uh, and so, um, you know, I'll, I'll end I'll, just that issue. I'll end with the poem. My dad read this poem in, in 1999 to the House Judiciary of Congress three months after uh, the shooting. And he said, your laws ignore our deepest needs. Your words are empty air. You've stripped away heritage, outlawed simple prayer. Gunshots fill our classrooms. Precious children die. Seeking for answers everywhere and ask the question why. You regulate restrictive law through legislative creed. And yet you fail to understand that God is what we need. And he went on to say that he wasn't promoting that we put necessarily religion back into schools, but that a recognition that we are three part beings, that there are spiritual heart centered principles that every person needs. And we need it in our schools. We need it in our families. We need it on our communities. We need it in our culture. There's no one single answer that will stop school shootings from happening. First primarily is the shooter themselves. You know, because somebody that wants to take the time to do something, plan it and do something evil, they're going to find a way. So if that person doesn't change, if that person doesn't make a a choice, then the next thing is another person stepping out of their way in compassion and taking the time for somebody that's in a dark place and, and bringing them out and encouraging them. The biggest thing I do when I go into schools, Billy, is not try to stop bad things from happening. It's not what I do. It's like trying to fight darkness. You don't, I'm not an anti-bullying, anti-suicide, even though I get labeled my family's program, we get labeled as that. That's not what I go in thinking about. I go in thinking about inspiring, speaking to the light that is within every person. And you say, well, there's not a light in every person. Well, there's a scripture that says in Proverbs that the life of a person is the candle of the Lord. We are fearfully, wonderfully made in the image of God. 
So your life when you're born, whether – and you don't have a b- belief system at that point. You don't have your th- theology in order. You know, Your life is the candle of the Lord. So I'm speaking to that light, spiritually speaking, that is in every person and and trying to speak to that. It's the it's the things that block that bushel that Jesus talks about, that bushel that blocks that light from shining. And so I'm that's what I try to do is speak to that, inspire the uh the 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 life and light that's within students and and I have one of my biggest messages in my program is that you have incredible built-in value that you were born with. And it's not based on what you look like or what you can do for others. It's not based on what other people think about you. And now our value to this world is based on what we do, but we always have a built-in value that's always there. And it's and it's important and it's not an egotistical thing. It's not saying my value is more than someone else's. It's just recognizing I have incredible value. We have to we have to teach ourselves and our children to see themselves this way. It's how God sees us. It's how we're made. It's how we're and even if you don't believe in God, you I can tell you a, a, a lot of things about your yourself that would make you go wow like right now your brain is sending 70 trillion messages to your body you know i've been on camp i've been on film sets where they have eighty thousand dollar camera lenses they can't come close to doing what the natural (laughs) eye can do you know so just there's a lot of amazing things about you as a person and it's not egotistical to to say that i that that value i have that fearfully wonderfully made fearfully wonderfully that's who you really are and, uh, and so, um, we got to speak these kinds of th- things into each other, ourselves and kids. Um, and then yeah. we'll see, um, cultural impact on schools. So I have one more question for you because I don't want to take much more of your time here. So we got a couple of minutes left and this is an important one because we've talked about a lot. We've talked about the issues facing the country. We've talked about your sister and your journey. And I want to kind of bring it back to you because you have gone through a lot over the last couple of decades. What has been the toughest issue for you in light of what happened at Columbine to move past and journey through? My biggest issue has been that I have made my identity, my whole identity sometimes about what I do and about my, 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 my past story. Uh, I, I share about it a lot because it's, it's tied to my purpose and I want to make a positive impact through that. But um, you are not just what you do and you're, you are not your past. And I share, I'm sharing my, about, about my past. Um, a lot, uh, but it's to affect current things today. And sometimes I'm not talking about the past at all, but I, I have to bring it up t- when I, when I start off and sharing my story. And, um, and so I've learned to just tell it like it's a story. It's not me. I, I, for me personally, one thing that's helped me is to know that I'm not my, my story matters. Your story matters, but you're not your story. You have a past story and a current one happen, happening right now. You have a future story, but your story is like the journey or path that you're on. And you're the person on the journey, but that journey is not you. You are more than that journey. You you are an eternal spiritual being. Um, you, if you're, 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 you're more than your body. You're more than your brain. You are a spirit. And that uh, spirit was uh, given to you by God. But so I, for me, um, not getting trapped in the past, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, and, and, uh, and even now I'm, I'm working on a book, you know, and, uh, and if I, if you get, you, it's okay to visit the past, to learn your lessons, but don't live there. Don't get stuck there. And there's people, all of us, we can get, you know, all shame, regret, and most sadness lives in the past. All anxiety and worry lives in the future. That's why we're supposed to live in today. All you ever, all you will ever have is today. Ten years from now, all you will have is right now. So it's learning. It's learning to 
not get trapped in either the future or the past. And, um, and I, can I end with my favorite poem? Yes, my, you can. Uh, my, that has been very helpful for me, um, to, in my healing process. Um, and still it's crazy, but there's still things that we all need healing from. I'm still getting healing even to this day on some things, but the poem is called in the quiet and it's in the quiet. I find peace where the outside noises cease, where my mind has settled down and my thoughts no longer race. In the chambers of my spirit, I have found a secret place. There the unseen things embrace me, the invisible that's real. And we there enjoy the treasure that activity would steal. Hear the whisper of the poets who have beckoned us to know of that inner sanctuary where we seldom ever go. In the quiet of our being, Creativity is born, and it rises to the surface to a world that's hurt and torn. Deep within me, love replaces all the anger and the fear, and the stillness is a knowing who I am and why I'm here. Mm. Those are powerful words. And I always love when we get to talk and you kind of pull the, the poetry in because it makes you think. It makes you think deeply about all of these themes. These are all issues we all face these struggles, right? And so you always do such a good job of bringing that all home. And I want to give, just before we go here, I want to give you a chance because you are working, not only are you working on a book, you have a podcast coming. Where can people go to find out everything you're doing to listen to the podcast once it's live? So then go to my website. It's just craigscott.org. And uh, if they're interested in having me speak, I speak at uh, conferences, I speak, I've spoken a lot of educational conferences. I do churches, uh, rallies and events. I've even spoken to some companies, um, but a, a lot of schools, mostly schools uh, from all the way from elementary, middle and high. So uh, that's my speaking. But yes, I have a podcast uh, and I'll release it actually this Saturday because it marks the 25th anniversary of the Columbine shooting, April 20th. And, um, and I'll, I've got uh, some episodes ready to go but it's called pain into purpose. So my question for my guests who have incredible stories, I just had Lou Gossett Jr. on who he, if you don't know, he was an Academy Award winning actor who uh, recently passed away, but he was 87 years old, a real man of peace. He was friends with um, some of the, la one of the last people that traveled around with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and had an, an amazing story. He produced um, a film with uh, uh, Nelson Mandela. He was in the show Roots. Um, he was, uh, uh, Sergeant Foley and, um, officer or gentleman. And anyway, I just some amazing people. What I wanted to do is I wanted to show some people who've been through some, we've all been through pain, but people that have been through some really painful things that have now come through it and can share the lessons they've learned. And a lot of them are, are, have come into a place of real success. Not all of them, but, uh, so pain into purpose will be, is the name of my podcast. And I've got amazing host. Uh, he's like a dad to me. His name is Mark Finn Cannon. I met him on my first set. He's cast over 100 movies and shows. And we film it here in Atlanta near a big movie studio called Trillith. And so we, uh, that's that if they want to check it out, um, the first one I'll be releasing this Saturday, um, just visit craigscott.org. And uh, if you get a chance, um, uh, check out the movie about my sister called I'm Not Ashamed, and I uh, hope that you find it inspiring. Well, Craig, I find you inspiring, and I appreciate you taking the time and joining us today. We'll have you back again sometime soon. Thank you, Billy. Love you, man.